Welcome everybody to the Nightly News Podcast. This is Professor Paul Miller sitting in today with a a group of individuals who we probably have heard quite a bit from. Um, The Director of Counseling Services, Tom Palmieri. Tom, it's such a pleasure to have you back on the show. Uh, Thanks for keeping inviting me back, Paul. I wouldn't invite you back if you weren't such a quality guest. I mean, you know, um, we do try to have Tom down here each and every term to keep you up to date with what's going on in our counseling center and a lot of big things going on. Obviously, fans of the podcast are familiar with Liz Yoder. Liz was down here a couple of different times. Liz has completed her internship, and we did have her on for a little farewell Mm -hmm. last term, and I'm really glad we got to do that. But as one door closes, another opens, as they say, and we'd like to welcome new counseling center intern, John Ashman. John, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Howdy. Thanks for having me on. You're I'm welcome. excited to be here. Well, we're excited to have you. John is a student, a master's degree student, if I'm not mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken, from Penn State Harrisburg. And uh, we're going to talk with John and Tom today about some big things that have been happening over the course of the, since we've had them on recently. Mm-hmm. Well, Tom, let's start at the top. The biggest news that you have is that the Counseling Center has changed from Bollinger Hall now to ATEC 312. Um, Would you like to maybe share any of the reasons uh, for the move and and how things might change? Sure. So we consolidated over the break from the last term into the start of this one. So that really came about because we wanted to be set up in a way that we were able to access and support students most directly. So now when you walk in, there's a suite of three offices. So all of the therapists that are working there will be able to have immediate access to each other. It allows for a lot more privacy than we previously had. So for folk that used to see me in Bollinger, for example, I had a small waiting room that was pretty like wide open at anybody that was walking across the hallway could see into. Um, and for those that met with our interns in Bollinger 59, you know, they had to walk through faculty space in order to be seen. So, and I will say that everybody that worked on that second floor was super good with keeping students' confidentiality, but at the same token, it's one of those things where you never know who that keeps away. So now just the ability to walk into one door, have everybody be there and not have to have any of those concerns about confidentiality for me is something that I've been shooting for for a good little while. And as an aside, I think something that that might be, and maybe this wasn't even in the thought process, is the ATEC is one of our main buildings. Mm -hmm. Students go there for many of their classrooms, club meetings. There is the cafeteria there. You know, maybe just the increased traffic that's in that building in a general sense might increase to some maybe more students coming into your office. Yeah, we did look at that, especially for the students in our evening and continuing ed programs, because it's funny, I would always be able to connect with those students just because of what we do as far as Blackboard, what we do as far as um, having faculty and staff make students aware that like we exist. But it's one of those things where if a student only had one evening class a week in ATEC and I send them an email like, hey, I'm located in Bollinger Hall, where is that? Because <laughs> if you are just having one class in ATEC, you don't need to know where anything else is. It's funny. You would be surprised at how often that happens. In mm-hmm. fact, last term, I had my evening class in ATEC, and we ended up meeting at the library for one of the classes, and I had like three or four students ask me where the library was. And, <laughs> and at first, I was kind of surprised, like... Really, you're not sure where the library is. And then, to your point, I thought about that. You know, if and because most of the night classes do end up being in ATEC, mm-hmm. so if you're only ever in ATEC, you may not have ever gone around to the cam- other campus buildings. So, I, I, you know, I wonder if, if long term that might be a way to, if nothing else, give you some more exposure, but also an opportunity to have additional foot traffic. Yeah, so I'm really excited um, about what the rest of the term in particular has in store for it, but just kind of in general what it's going to mean to have that kind of like established presence. Awesome. Well, we want to get to know John. John will be here through August. So John, not only do we hope to have you back again, we hope to have you back several times uh, because it is, to me, very important to have both, uh, you know, Tom and and whoever else is working because... 
what you do and the service that you offer is something that can be so important for so many people. And I really try my very best to get that information out to as many people as I possibly can, whether it's through the podcast or whether it's through my classes. So, John, let's learn a little bit about you. Uh, First of all, where are you from? So I am from Florida, actually. So what do you think? We are here on one of the coldest days that I can recall <laughs> in quite some time. So how, I mean, obviously, if you're in Penn State Harrisburg, you're, you're somewhat familiar with the weather. But I don't know if you're from Florida that you can ever get used to, you know, a 15 degree morning. You know, I'm doing the best I can with it. You know, the best thing I learned this year is keep an ice scraper in your car at all times. I've had to use Tupperware one too many times to clean <laughs> out the windows beforehand. I guess that's not a bad idea. But yeah, I, I, we definitely needed it over the weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, so tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get involved in uh, the major that you're in? And maybe what are some of your goals long term once you finish school? Yeah, so I have an undergrad degree from Florida Gulf Coast University in psychology. Uh, After I got my degree, I took on an internship at an applied behavior analysis clinic and really fell in love with that kind of work. What is that? So that is, I did a lot of work with children on the autism spectrum. So that was primarily my focus. I work with clients from about ages four to ages 17. And that was working in the community, at the school, and in the clinic. And I really had a passion for that. And I stuck around for a little while. But I wanted to continue my education, so I applied to several counseling programs or several clinical psychology programs, and Penn State Harrisburg was interested in taking me on. So, Probably for good reason. I don't know if Tom had the opportunity to to share with you, um, and and of course I don't begrudge you if you haven't. Um, I'm very familiar. My son, who um, is about to turn 20 years old tomorrow, mm-hmm. is oh, on tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow Happy is birthday. his birthday. <laughs> uh, Hunter will be 20. Uh, he is on the autism spectrum, and um, we have had. We've been very lucky in terms of the services that he's been able to get, but we are in full freak out mode at this point because, as you may or may not know, uh, he's able to go to school into his 21st year. So he will have the rest of this year and then one more year in public schools. And we are really concerned about his future. Mm -hmm. Um, He does work. He has two different jobs and uh, we're happy with that. And and he does wonderfully at these, at Mm -hmm. these positions. Um, But we are very, very concerned about, uh, about his future. So sort of to be continued on that, but hopefully things are falling in the right direction. I will say that the support that we've gotten from his school has been fantastic. And we just hope that things continue to go in the right direction because, you know, it's not like he's got a lot of options, you know? Mm-hmm. So obviously uh, that's something near and dear to my heart. And I actually volunteer in the community with a wonderful organization called Challenger Baseball, which is uh, a little league for uh, children with special needs, mm-hmm. not just necessarily autism spectrum disorder, but uh, I have a wide variety of, of kiddos from, from different backgrounds. And I got to tell you, it's probably the most rewarding thing in my life that I do is go out on a Sunday and, and play some baseball. And I love baseball. So to be able to teach these kids the game that I love so much and to see the joy on their faces. I mean, I wish I wish I could just do that all day every day because it, it would make my life so much different, that's for sure. Um, so, you know, you're, you're here in Penn State. Um, obviously, since you're with your internship, you're, it seems that you're getting close to the end of your program. So I'm, I'm assuming that you, you complete in August? I do. I finish up in August. So I'm at the point where I have two more classes that I'm taking at the school. And after that, it's all internship, all field work. So what are your future plans with this master's degree? Maybe what, what doors might the master's open that might not have been open otherwise? Interesting. So right now, I'd like to really focus on... One, developing myself as a counselor. It's always been my passion to work with college students. I remember even when I entered the program and people asked me, where do you want to do your practicum? Where do you want to do your internship? I said, I want to work with college students. I want to be a part of this academic environment. And I want to make that a part of my life as I go on as well. So part of that includes doing research. Part of that includes working with college students and trying to build those skills and develop that and potentially apply for a PhD in the coming years. What is it about college students that's so interesting to you? You know, when you reach that age of 18 or, you know, when you reach that young age and you're really beginning to take your own life into your hands. So you're really developing that independence and you're discovering who you want to be as a person, not just, you know, who you've been, what you've been needing to do up until that point. 
Oh, of course. Uh, I mean, that's part of the reason that I love doing what I do, to be honest with you, because I have the opportunity to work. College is not just necessarily 18 to 22 anymore. No. I mean, we, we we have we run the gamut. I mean, I've had students from 18. I, I had a, a lady in my class, the, the one of the nicest people I've ever met in my entire life, in her late 50s and, and potentially early 60s. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that brings up some other problems as well, because maybe on one side... You you know, you might have the the typical types of problems that an eighteen to twenty two year old might deal with, but then you also have uh, you know students of all ages dealing with a wide variety of things. So I think mm-hmm. that not only is it just that the ability to be able to work with people that are still growing up and finding themselves, but really the ability to work with such a great wide cross section of of unique individuals. So, exactly. Well, John. One big thing that you are working on thus far, and I know this because I, t- uh, I have Adrian Thoman down every single um, month to talk about the wonderful things that are going on here on campus, and she alerted me to something called Phonics Friday, and I'd ask her, I said, Adrian, I'm not familiar with this program. What is this? And she explained that... Um, it used to be the Word Wednesday has now been shifted to days of the week, but you can't really call it Word Friday. That doesn't really have that ring to it. Mm-hmm. And that Phonics Friday was sort of that continuation to that program. First of all, and, and Tom, please feel free to chime in here. Let's talk about that Word Wednesday now, be henceforth known as Phonics Friday. Where did this come from, and why do you still feel that it's such an important component of what you're doing here? Yeah, so this is... Bit- Word Wednesday had been a program that predated me. It lived in a couple of different places on campus. And then part of what Liz was really helpful in doing was kind of taking it into like the common space in the cafeteria and just engaging students around it. So instead of them having to come to a program, it's sort of like, well, you're already going to be here eating lunch, so we're just going to bring a program to you. Such a great idea, by the way. Yeah, and it was something that like me and a couple of the other directors have been kicking around, like, why don't we just do this and let's just see what happens. And it's, it's worked out. Like We have folk come in, we feed them. They talk and it's just like a different type of conversation that you might have in a classroom because it's not like there's a structured curricula. Like, you know, we give out some material that frankly I don't even make, like the John and Liz make it. And we just kind of engage them around like, you know, what does stuff like this mean to you? When we were, when I was interviewing for whoever was going to replace Liz, I was keeping in mind like someone that would be comfortable engaging folk within that setting and be able to execute on it. So we had the first one um the friday of week two we had students participate it was great and so the goal is to kind of keep it kicking and because he has class on wednesday fortunately phonics rhymes somewhat with friday so it worked out (laughs) it does you know i will say that and i believe you were still a part of uh, word wednesday at the time but we as an entire club the entire Mm -hmm. nightly news had one of our club meetings because we were meeting wednesday at the time and, and it worked perfectly and and i gotta tell you from students, almost all of these students that are in the club I've had in class at some point, and it was very interesting for me to get their perspective on some of these different types of things and how much different, even though we've had class with one another for, in some cases, multiple times, to be able to go to that. And it was it's just more laid back. There's not as much pressure on the students to be you know, on their A game. Hey, there's a professor here. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's one of the most unique things about the program is that you're, you're able to talk about things on a college campus that really should be spoken about. And unfortunately, it seems in our day and age, not not at Central Penn necessarily, but at college writ large, a lot of these things, an opportunity to talk about some of these interesting subjects really kind of gets lost. And if it is spoken about, it's spoken about in a classroom, which is a much different setting, Mm -hmm. wouldn't you agree? Yeah. And I think about kind of the culture of different institutions in terms of, and I think this even intersects with some of the stuff that you probably teach about, Paul, about like how um, culture is shaped by media and how media shapes culture. And we, like, I was kind of thinking about like when I was in college, like almost 20 years ago, and like and how we would have conversations. And I remember programs like this existing where it was just like people getting together and talking, and it wasn't about like you have to persuade other people to feel a certain way. It wasn't that you had to speak to like write quote unquote answers. It was just like, hey, What's your opinion? Why do you feel this way? Oh, okay. Like, let's just keep going and see who feels what way. And that's 
kind of what we were really hoping to capture with some of this. I really think that what you just said is so interesting because literally last week we had this exact thing happen. Mm -hmm. Basically, we were talking about culture and we were talking about the different components of culture. And what we did was I asked, I, I had five groups and I had five different orientations. I had gender, I had um, different ages, and I assigned each group to find one positive example mm -hmm. of representation in the media, whether it be a YouTube video or an advertisement or like a magazine ad, and then I asked them to find one negative because what we were talking about was stereotyping and how the media really often does impact stereotypes that we have. And it was honestly, it was the first time I'd ever tried it, and it actually went so well. So I That's appreciate great. you bringing that up. Well, John, so Phonics Friday is 1230 every Friday in the Night and Day Cafe. Um, let's hear about some of the, so I know that you just got to campus, but you have had the opportunity to do um, at least one thus far. Yes. Let's talk about your experience with that. You know, I really enjoyed it. It was wonderful to be able to sit down with the students and just kind of get to know the campus as a culture. Um, the word that we did was compromise, and I wanted to be able to take it from a point of view where students would be able to reflect on the meaning of that word in their lives. You know, when is it a good time to start looking for opportunities to compromise? Where should we set our boundaries? And like we said, there's not often times to have these conversations. And I think it's really important to facilitate that in a way where we can just have a dialogue, keep it casual, get to know each other, and have a dialogue about it. And there's no, there's no really repercussions if they say something that... First of all, with something like that, there's really no right and wrong. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but I think a lot of times, and, and I'm sure that both of you have either seen this through being in front of a class or being a part of the class, that some people are very hesitant to participate mm -hmm. because they're not only necessarily afraid of getting something wrong, but they're also afraid of thoughts that their classmates might have about them based on the answer, mm -hmm. which... I constantly try to tell them, like, you have to stop doing this. You have to just be willing to put put yourself out there. That's how you're going to be successful. But I think what's interesting about this particular program is it's very it's a very low stakes environment. Mm -hmm. It's it's an opportunity for people to just kind of talk about how they're feeling, which really is the whole goal of what you both are trying to accomplish, right? Exactly. It's just a chance for us to get together and learn from each other. Well, uh, there's a few mm -hmm. more things that I really want to talk about, and it's something that I find really interesting. Now, obviously, the Nightly News always supportive of everything going on in the theater with theater director Janet Bixler. In fact, she'll be on later on this term to talk a little bit more about hide-and-seek, which we'll chat about in a minute. Now, the Counseling Center has been involved historically in theater productions, mm -hmm. not necessarily on the stage, but maybe sort of in the background. You are going to be uh, somewhat involved with the Vagina Monologues that take place on February 13th at 7 p.m., and also the student-created play Hide and Seek that takes place from March 5th to March 7th. Can you share with us how you're involved with them and maybe you know what you look forward to in the coming events? Sure. So with the Vagina Monologues specifically, so Adrian is really doing a beautiful job of running the show. She's devoting a lot of time into cultivating with the um, speakers, like their individual monologues and what that's going to be like for them to really speak from that place. Those of you that are listening that may have seen the show last year, be familiar with it. Really ranges the gamut of things that are funny and light to things that are profoundly heavy and profoundly serious. And so she's doing that one-on-one -on -one work with working with the speakers on how, what it's like for them to kind of come and speak from that place. And what we'll be doing is in the kind of group rehearsal leading up to it, which is the first time that everybody else will be hearing what everybody else is saying, um, really kind of processing that in whatever way the actors need. For Hide and Seek, we're going to be part of the creative process with Janet um, and the team of really working through what it's going to be like to share their individual stories in that kind of theatrical setting, but also what it's going to be like to embody like a character but them still knowing and the audience still knowing that, no, this is their real life. We all hide from a lot of things. Like fear is such a real and powerful human emotion, even if we don't like to pretend that that's the case. Well, 
What I think is so interesting about what Janet does, especially with these student-created plays, is she really asks people to look inside mm-hmm. and to talk mm-hmm. about things that are frankly very personal. And in fact, in uh, the last student-created play that we saw, we saw some people talk about some very serious things. Mm-hmm. And, and again, I'm, not that I can spoil anything because it was it was sort of a one-time only show, mm-hmm. but there were several people. And one I remember is uh, Nightly News Secretary Parker Rose uh, shared something, an experience that he went through as a firefighter Mm -hmm. that I, and I've known Parker for years, never knew about him. And for him to be able to share that with, frankly, yes, people he did know. Obviously, you know, I was Mm -hmm. in the audience. But people he didn't know, Mm -hmm. that has got to be so difficult. So would you say that going forward, you're you're there for, you're obviously part of the creative. But would you say that, that that is also an important component is being there to help people work through all of this. Yeah, one of the things that Janet and I really see eye to eye, eye, to eye on is this idea of authenticity, then congruency. So congruency from a mental health standpoint means that what you do and say on the outside is reflective of how you actually feel on the inside. And that kind of bravery and willingness to put yourself out there, it has the potential to really positively impact community building and at its core that's what i believe janet's trying to do with with the theater to kind of create and develop that sense of community and because it's student driven and because these are people that this might be the very first time that they're talking about themselves in this way like there's a parallel process where everybody's really able to support each other. So yeah, this is something that I personally look forward to every year and I'm always happy to be a part of it. Awesome. Well, uh, it's we're, we're coming to the end of the show, but I want to have the opportunity for you to present any final pitch or if you want to talk about how students can go about contacting you if they feel that they could uh, benefit from the Counseling Center. So please feel free to give any type of pitch you, you would like for you and what you do here and anything in addition. To yeah, what we sure, about. I'll do my spiel. So you can access us in a couple of different ways. So you are always more than welcome to just swing on up to ATEC 312 on the third floor. And once you walk in, if either myself or John's door is open, you know, just come on in. And if we're not able to necessarily meet with you right then and there, at the very least, we can get you on the calendar. Um, if you go on Blackboard, so all you have to do is log in and click on the student services tab in the upper black banner. It's the middle button, I believe. One of the drop down menus that you'll see says counseling services. So you can just click on the intake schedule link. It'll ask you a couple of questions. So you submit that. It automatically pops into our shared mailbox. And then whichever one of us happens to read it first, we'll get back to you and give you a call, try to get you in. You can all just email um, myself or John directly, or we also have a counseling email that we both check. So CPC counselor, all one word at centralpen.edu. And yeah, and I also say, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to focus in on in 2020 is being able to offer some different programs like in the classroom. So we actually had the opportunity to do Word Wednesday in a class last term, and I'm really hoping that we're able to do more of that. So any faculty that are listening, if you want to give us 45 minutes, we'll give you and you and your students free pizza and just kind of get it rolling. But really just talking about the value of kind of bringing student services like into the class, because sometimes they're could be like a really big disconnect between what happens in the classroom and what happens outside the classroom. So anytime that we're able to kind of collaborate in that way, it can be really powerful. So yeah, that's my spiel. And I'm going to tell you, one of the best memories I have of you is when you came into one of my classes and we did the calm down jars. Mm -hmm. And it was such a great, it was a Friday afternoon. It was again a, a more laid back and it it really it was right toward the end of a term and I wanted it I wanted you to come in so much because I knew that my class was so stressed out mm-hmm. and I think that you just did an amazing job and of course you have a variety of programming that you can come into the classrooms and uh, I just appreciate everything you do and, and thank you so much for thank all you. of your efforts I know that this is your job but it means so much to so many so I appreciate that very much Tom and John 
Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. All right. Well, that is going to do it for another episode of the Nightly News Podcast. Do stay tuned. Steve Hassinger will be up uh, talking about the CPEC job fair coming up here in February. But before we get out of here, I just wanted to remind you to go out and check out the Vagina Monologues on February 13th at 7 p.m. Check out the student-created play Hide and Seek, March 5, 6, and 7. And every Friday at 1230, Phonics Friday with John uh, down in the Night and Day Cafe. So, gentlemen, as always, thank you so much, and we look forward to having you back again next term. Thanks so much, Paul. Thank you very much. All right. So for John Ashman, for Tom Paul Mary, this is Professor Paul Miller. Stay tuned for Steve Hassinger and the CPEC Job Fair, but we'll see you again next time on the Nightly News Podcast. This is Norman Geary, news correspondent. Thank you for listening to the Nightly News Podcast, the voice of the nights. Welcome, everybody, to the Nightly News Podcast. This is Professor Paul Miller, and we are here for always one of my favorite days. We are here with Career Services Director Steve Hassinger to talk about the upcoming CPEC Job Fair. It's going to take place on February 18th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Radisson in Camp Hill. It is a free event for Central Penn students. So uh, today, really what we're going to do is we're going to try to share some of the things that are going to be going on there at the CPEC Job Fair, but also talk to uh, a current student that we will address here in just a moment. Uh, but Steve, first of all, welcome back to the podcast. It's been a little while since we've had you on. Thank you, Professor Miller. I always enjoy being a guest on your podcast. And you're one of my favorite guests, so I, I appreciate your, your time. Uh, we're also being joined by Nightly News Secretary Parker Rose. Parker, welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's great to be back. You know, one of the things that I want to chat with you about, uh, Parker, is your experience at previous job fairs, because one of the things that we're going to talk about is a couple different types of students. First of all, those who are actively seeking internships or career positions, and then those and, and the benefits you might have for a student who maybe is in their first or second year, and maybe internships still kind of far down the road, talking about why this could be very important for students to attend. Steve, first of all, uh, one of the things that I want to chat with you about is the CPEC job fair. First of all, can you give us a little background about this job fair and maybe talk about why this is one for students to circle on their calendar? Absolutely. Well, the first question I always get is, what does CPEC stand for? Well, it stands for Central Pennsylvania Employment Consortium, because this event is put on by a consortium of colleges and universities. So there's 13 other schools, mostly in the Central Pennsylvania area. And we all go together and we meet four to five times a year to plan this event. We also have eight employer members of CPAC that meet with us regularly. So it's great for us as career counselors to be able to kind of pick their brains a little bit, talk about the job fair from their perspective on the other side of the table, and what kind of things we can do to make the job fair the best experience for the employers as well. Uh, so this event is going to draw some companies, organizations that might not go around to 14 different colleges to recruit because they can come to one place, one centralized location, and they can report or re recruit from all of those schools at the same time. I think what's interesting is, uh, you know, I constantly have my classes, especially if, if they're applicable come to the CPEC job fair. Now, it is sometimes a little more difficult for students to get there because it is off campus, but uh, you, rest assured, have a plan for those students. Can you just share some of the, the things that you're able to do for maybe students who don't have transportation? Absolutely. Well, first and foremost, we have reserved the college van for that entire day. Uh, so we will provide transportation if we know that students need transportation. So if they need to uh, ride to and from campus to the job fair, all they have to do is contact Career Services and let us know what their schedule's like, when they're available. Obviously, we can't be just running the shuttle constantly back and forth, but we will have at least two to three times from that 10 to 2 time frame where we can leave campus and leave the job fair to get students back and forth. Students also um, frequently will carpool. So uh, they will talk to other students who are going to be going and, you know, they'll pull their resources and figure out ways to get there. So there's definitely ways to get to uh, the Radisson from campus, which is only about a 10 minute drive. Yeah, if that, you know, job fairs to me are something that is so important to the educational experience. You know, it's, it's interesting this term. I am actually having two of my basically freshman 100 level classes go to this job fair. And I constantly get this question. And in fact, I, I literally just had to answer this question earlier today. Mm -hmm. Professor Miller, I'm only in term one or I'm only in term two here at the college. Why in the world would I want to go to a job fair and why are you requiring us to go? 
Yeah, well, I can think of a lot of reasons to go to the job fair. Uh, number one, let's suppose that student is their first or second term, and they know exactly what they want to do for their internship. Um, or they have an idea of exactly what type of job they want to get with their degree and their major when they finish. This is a great way to go and to start exploring the employers that are going to be able to offer those kind of opportunities and to really start developing those relationships. It's interesting because uh, sometimes, you know, employers will come out to different networking events, various job fairs, and it'll be, the, you know, the same recruiters, the same people that are coming out and representing them. And sometimes they actually get to, to see that student multiple times and and I've had employers come up to me already and say, hey, Steve, when is Parker Rose getting ready to graduate? Because we've seen him at several events, and we're really impressed with him, and we'd really like to make him part of our company. So you can kind of start developing those relationships. Let's say you have a first or ter- second term student who's in communications. They're in business. They're in criminal justice. They know they're in the right major. But those are kind of broad fields that offer a lot of different possibilities. Um, As a matter of fact, I spoke with a student who is further along in her education yesterday, but she's a business student, and she's having a hard time kind of figuring out where she fits in the world of business and what type of opportunities. So one of the things that we talked about yesterday is coming to the CPAC Job and Internship Fair is a great opportunity to talk to a wide variety of companies about a lot of different types of positions and find out what's involved. Some of these companies will also bring uh, managers with them from different departments who are even able to speak better about the specifics of the jobs uh, than the recruiters might be able to. You know, I want to bring Parker in on this. Parker, uh, you know, when we were talking off air, one of the things that we talked a little bit about was your experience w- at different job fairs. Now, this will be your first experience at CPAC, so I think that it's going to be a very interesting experience for you. But you have been to job fairs before. Yes. From your perspective, can you provide any kind of ideas, maybe some of the things that you took away from that job fair that you might be able to share with students that might be in that position? So I'm going to give it from both perspectives, from a student who may be a first-term student or a second-term student, and for students who are like me, getting ready to get ready to graduate soon and or start looking for internships. If you're a first-term and second-term student, like what Mr. Hassinger said and Professor Miller is, it's good to go to get your name on the radar. Build yourself a character. If you have a basic resume, display it. And just explain to them, I'm a first-term student, second-term student, but I show interest in the company. Also, what I learned in the class I took on Monday, I learned about have some knowledge about the company you're looking for. If you do that, they like to hear that because the things with job fairs is to get opportunities. And if you're a student like me who's looking for an internship, definitely make sure your resume, you have a cover letter, you're dressed professionally and you're ready to go like provide facts that you care about this company because that internship could turn into your full-time job eventually if they see a lot of potential in you well i don't think there's any question about that and i think that goes back to steve's original point is that you know when you go to a job fair i think a lot of times it can be overwhelming like for example that first time that you walked in even even at the one on campus did you find it maybe a little overwhelming when you walked in there yeah it can be a little overwhelming because they asked you questions like do you have your resume so when they see you come up to their table they're immediately like ready boom ready to talk to you get get your information want you to have an interview and all that which is okay but that's why i also say explain yourself hey i'm a first term student sector senior i'm just getting my feet wet to experience what it's like so i know what to expect when i'm older and they won't be afraid to understand that you just got to be upfront with them well and steve it almost comes back to like the same kind of rationale why you provide mock interviews because what what you're trying to do is simulate that opportunity in the future so if you have a mock interview with that person or maybe a second mock interview potentially When they have that interview in the future, they're not going to be so nervous. And it's not to say that you shouldn't be nervous. And I I tell people, in fact, if, if you're not nervous, there might be something wrong because, frankly, you should be nervous. You know, you should be able to have some of those nerves, but you have to be able to control that energy. At a job fair, though, to your point, you are having the opportunity to work and meet with different organizations. And a lot of times those people at those table are either recruiters or they might be from the, the people from HR who might eventually interview you. Absolutely. And they remember the people that they meet at a job fair who make a strong impression on them. 
sometimes students get frustrated because they go to a job fair and they will have that interaction with the employer and the employer will say, well, if you want to apply for this internship, if you want to apply for this job, you need to go to our website. And the student will say, well, I could have done that sitting at home in my pajamas. But it's that interaction. And you're absolutely right. Every interaction that you have with a potential employer um, should kind of be treated as an interview. Because it kind of is a mini interview uh, where you're having an opportunity to tell that employer a little bit about yourself and what you have to offer. And one of the things that career services can do with students, if they contact us in advance of the job fair and make an appointment with us, is we can help them work on uh, kind of their 30-second commercial, their elevator speech, we refer to it. Because it can be intimidating uh, to just walk up to a, a a company at a table where there might be 90 employers in the room and start talking to them. What do I say? How much do I say? Et cetera. So career services can help them with that and crafting that uh, introductory elevator speech. One of the things that I share, and I'm just going to give a tip here and, and Parker, please feel free to give an, another tip after I, I talk about this. One of the things that I do and I've done at job fairs in the past is I'm sort of there to coach in that I have everybody kind of check in with me and I try to explain and I do we do talk about this prior to going and, and you're going to come into some of my classes and talk about that as well. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I try to do before I send the student in is I have them sort of break down. First of all, there's how many companies are going to be there, for example? Well, as of this morning, and we're taping this on January 22nd, there were 72 companies registered already. So last year there were 97. So I would su- suspect that we're going to be somewhere between 80 and 100 companies. So that in itself can be overwhelming. And especially you, you bring up constantly majors like accounting, like Parker, communications. Almost every single company is looking for an, uh, someone in accounting or right. someone in business or someone in communications to work for their organization. So some people might kind of think the the uh, pray and spray method in that they would try to go up to each and every company. If you're going to try to approach 90 companies, I mean, that's just extremely overwhelming. So what I try to share with my students is, first of all, you want to try to spend at least an hour. I would not recommend necessarily spending four hours at the event. It can really take a lot out of you. But if you kind of go into it with a strategy, I'm going to take one hour, and this 15 minutes I'm going to go speak to these four companies, and then I'm going to take a five-minute break. I'm going to regroup. I'm going to organize my materials. I'm going to you know, make note to myself to contact this person from on LinkedIn when I'm done, and then kind of do that on three separate occasions. Mm-hmm. I would say, personally, this is just me, that you really don't want to look at more than about 10 to 12 companies because much more than that gets so overwhelming. So what I share with students before they go in, have those, let's say, five companies that you absolutely want to go talk to, you absolutely want to make a good impression on, and then maybe have another five to six companies that you can, if you have time, Mm -hmm. then you can approach those specific companies. Don't try to go to every single table it just it's going to take too much out of you you're going to get overwhelmed you're not going to take enough away from it so that's my big tip parker professor miller you made very good points with that because me as an accounting major i know at this job there there's going to be a lot of companies that are have an accounting department but there's also a lot of companies that are strictly an accounting firm and for me as an accounting major i'm going to look for those accounting firm companies first because in my future i want to have a job in the accounting firm field so what I would do is I'm going to go on the website, see all the businesses, the ones that are accounting firms, I'm going to write down in the notebook. Then I'm going to take the advice that Mr. Hassinger gave us in Job Pursuit Seminar and read about their company. Give them something that is on their website that I looked research because like I said before, companies love when you do your research. You will get immediately like this person cares. And also this is common sense, but it's quite simple. Dress to impress. Your first impression is key. Surprisingly enough, Parker, I know to to you and I that that makes sense, but you would really be surprised, even not only on our own campus, but even at CPAC last year, I saw a handful of, it's, I would say rare, but I was very surprised that people as students are continuing to be more and more casual at these types of events. I, I couldn't agree with you more, Parker. I think you really do need to take the time and take the time to find your appropriate dress to go to this event. And also make sure you have questions for that company. You don't want to just end the conversation. If they ask, do you have any questions, do not say no. 
have a question, have a follow-up question. And also, don't be afraid to bring a notebook. Jot down the information they're giving you. This could be your internship that could lead you to your career job. And, you know, Steve, while we always talk about the importance of networking online through sites like LinkedIn, mm -hmm. there is no replacement for face-to-face. -face. I, I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, the opportunity that you have to get in front of these recruiters and these HR professionals is second to none. And a another reason why I think it's so important to be here. Can you comment on, on again, LinkedIn, very important. We talk about it all the time. But how is it different in the face-to-face -face context? Well, again, I mean, with LinkedIn, you, you can't see facial expressions. You can't see how somebody carries themselves, how they're dressed professionally, as Parker talked about. So really, when you're getting in front of that person, again, you're approaching it really like an interview because it kind of is a mini interview. <coughs> and I've had employers tell me um, the good, the bad, and the ugly from job fairs. And they really do remember when that person follows up with them with a LinkedIn request, when that person submits a resume um, online through their job site. Um, they really do remember the ones who have made that favorable impression. And it really can put you a step ahead of everybody else who's out there in cyberspace just simply submitting applications and submitting resumes. So I think it can be a, a real difference maker in the job search. I think an important component is is it really is that online, offline sort of hybrid right. is kind of how you find jobs in this day and age. Sure, is it possible to find jobs online? Of course it is. And, and you know, the, the further and further we come along with technology, the easier it's going to be. That being said, there's never going to be another opportunity, at least this year, for you to have that many recruiters, for that many people that are seeking employees, often entry level, because of the nature of the specific type of job fair. So I think it's important to, to Parker's point, do you know identify a couple of companies and so you might have well how can i do that well you can always go to cpec cpec dot info for an updated list of everyone so what i would suggest is just so happens to be president's day the day before take that day and take an hour or two out of your day and identify a handful of companies Take a look at their website, get to know them, because the worst thing that you can do is go up to that recruiter and say, what is it that you do? Right. That's literally the worst thing that yes. you can say. That's how you get shot down. And yeah. we learned that in the class. Like, and, he, he, and he learned it from an employer, not from me. Do, do a research. <laughs> do your research. Yeah. I, even though when I was in high school, I had one job interview, but I looked into, even though I worked in food service with the hospital, I looked in their company and overdressed to impress because they even looked at me it's like, you're dressing for the, I'm like, it's a job interview. You never know what to expect. Your first impression, you could do so good in your interview, but just the way you came to your interview could just ruin your chances or put a big impact on your chances. Steve, let me ask you. Uh, so we talked about younger students, students yeah. maybe in their first or second year, and some of the advantages, you know, just getting used to it, getting your, your feet wet in a job fair situation, so maybe you're not so nervous next time. What about those who are getting ready to go on internship? Do you have any advice for people who maybe this is a little bit urgent for them, some different approaches that they might take rather than someone who's kind of in their first year still? Absolutely. So number one, they're looking for places where they want to definitely go in and be an intern. So uh, the description that they've seen from the company, the types of internships that they offer um, have really intrigued them. So they especially are treating this like a job interview because it's an opportunity to, to maybe line up that internship. And we've had, we have students every year who walk away from this job fair uh, with an interview scheduled for an internship, several students who have gotten internships mm -hmm. as a result of attending, as well as people who have gotten um, permanent job opportunities as a result of attending. So they definitely want to be prepared with their resumes. They want to make sure that those resumes are flawless. Uh, Career Services is here to help you with resumes, to review resumes. Um, do not contact us on President's Day the day before the event and ask for that assistance. You can, and uh, you know we're off that day, but <laughs> if we're checking email and we have time, we might be able to reply. But you know, set, set up an appointment with us um, or even email us the resume, and we're happy to take a look at that and give you feedback. So you really want to make sure um, if you're actively searching for a job or an internship that you've got your resume ready to go, um, that you're approaching it like an interview and you're targeting those companies that you really are serious about going and doing an internship with. And I think one of the things that's important, too, is to if you are specifically looking for an internship, to be honest with some. Uh, so once 
don't just walk right up to them and say, hey, do you offer internships? Obviously have that initial conversation, yeah. but then follow up and say, you know, I, at this point I'm, I'm looking for an internship. What do you offer? Now, another thing that I think might be interesting and, and possibly worth noting is just because a company doesn't currently offer internships doesn't mean that they wouldn't necessarily be open. Do you have any tips for, let's say somebody like Parker has an organization that he wants to work for, but he goes and talks to them and say, you know, we haven't really ever thought about that. Do you have any tips for some ways that maybe Parker can open that door for himself and potentially for other students? Absolutely. So the first thing he can do is tell them what he's looking to do during his internship and what he has to offer. Because our students who are doing internship, they're coming prepared with skills where they can make an immediate impact from day one on that organization. So let them know what you have to offer. They do not have to have an internship program in place. As you said, we've had a lot of students who have gone to a company and have been the first intern that that company ever had. And our internship coordinator, Kristen Fike, will be happy to help to work with the student and with the employer to make sure that we have the paperwork in place that we need to have and make sure that it that it's going to be a good fit for them as well. One final thing, back to Parker's point about the dress. I think our com- career services department is above and beyond uh, maybe what some other schools are doing for the simple fact that you also provide professional clothing. So if you're out there and you're saying, you know, I really want to go to this or I have to go to this, I'm looking for an internship, but I really don't have anything to wear and I don't want to make a fool of myself, what can they do to maybe come into your office and get some assistance with that? Absolutely. So Contact Career Services set up a time to come in and meet with us. Uh, We do have a lot of professional clothing in the Career Center here in Somerdale. Just yesterday, I was at our Lancaster location, and I took 20 pieces of women's clothing, 20 pieces of men's clothing to Lancaster. So we also have an assortment in Lancaster. We don't have every size for everybody. So if we don't have the size, we don't have the specific thing that you're looking for, we also have gift cards that we can provide to Community Aid, which has uh, stores just about everywhere that we have students at this point, um, and they can be used only for professional clothing and shoes. I love it. You know, Parker, before we get out of here today, first of all, I, I want to thank you for, for sharing some of the tips. Um, let's let's be a little more selfish. How are you going to approach the CPEC job very for your first time? I am dressing to impress Professor Miller. I am going in there with a big smile and trying because I'm right now I'm debating do I want to do my internship my last term or do I want to do it, get it over with and do it. And when I graduate, I have a job landed for me. But either way, I'm going in my best of my ability to find that accounting firm that I want to work for as an intern and hopefully get a full-time job with them. Well, and before you go in, I would love to have a a brief conversation. I'm going to be there all day. I will be there bright and early. I'll probably get there at 9 o'clock, if that's all right, with with Mr. Hassinger. And and I'm going to be there all day. So certainly, uh, anybody out there listening that's coming, even if you're not in one of my classes, I encourage you not only just to stop by and talk to me, talk to Kristen Fike, talk to Steve Hassinger. Let us help you. That's what we're here for. That's why we are there. Because we obviously, you know, we're going to be working and and helping with check-ins and things like that. But none of us are going to be too busy that we can't sit and chat with you and help you. Um, Steve, before we get out of here, um, could, did you want to just talk about some of the companies that are going to be there? I know there. I, obviously you can't go over all 72 right. that have been booked, but right. do you want to highlight a couple of specific companies? I do. I'd be happy to highlight some companies. And then I also just want to briefly mention the app that is available, which can be really helpful in organizing um, how you're going to attack the job fair. So some of the companies, for instance, um, that are going to be there, Armstrong World Industries. This is a huge company, you know, uh, in the Lancaster area. Um, Obviously, they have lots of different needs for majors across the board, really. Uh, Geisinger Health Systems will be there. Geisinger Health Systems is a huge healthcare provider. So again, they have needs across the spectrum. Um, And, you know, sometimes people don't think about healthcare hospitals, organizations like that also need accounting people. They also need communications people. They need marketing people. They need IT people. You know, so a huge company there. Uh, We've got WGAL-TV. 
coming. Great for your communications students, I'm going to have to speak with them. Absolutely. Uh, we've got the Pennsylvania Office of Attorney General. We've had uh, legal students who have done internships with them, criminal justice students uh, also may be interested in that in that organization. We've got the Milton Hershey School coming. So, you know, you can see there's a, a wide variety here. And maybe somebody, maybe one of those first or second term students is coming. Just They just kind of maybe want a part-time job. And we've got some retail places coming like Kohl's and Target. And they have great uh, management internship opportunities. But they also obviously have part-time retail opportunities available for somebody who's just looking for a part-time job. Well, I'm glad you brought that up too because one of the things I try to share with my students is that, look, no disrespect to those who've worked in retail or the restaurant business. I know, Parker, you've worked in the restaurant business. I worked in the restaurant business for a very long time. But what could actually really benefit you more in the long run is if you can try to break in to your field, even at a part-time capacity while you're in college. Because honestly, Steve, I think the days of the zero experience getting a job are, are really gone. And in fact, most places want at least one to potentially three years of experience. And students might ask, well, how am I supposed to get that experience? Well, anyway, you can get your foot in the door, work in part-time jobs, volunteering at some of these organizations. That's a great great way to gain yourself some experience. Absolutely. One more time, the CPEC Job Fair, February 18th from 10 to 2 at the Radisson Camp Hill. It is free for Central Penn students. There is no registration required, if I'm not mistaken. They don't need to requ- uh, to register in advance. However, if they do need transportation, they do need to contact us to let us know that they need transportation, and we'll talk to them about their schedule. Of course. And the final thing that I wanted to mention was regarding the app that is available. It's a free app that can be downloaded from the App Store or from Google Play. You're just going to search for CPEC. CPEC, CPEC Job Fair. Uh, the app is really cool because it allows you to search the employers on there. You're going to have a profile of the company. You're going to have the majors that they're most interested in, the types of positions that they have available. You can save your favorites. Um, when you save your favorite, about a week before the fair, there will be a uh, map, a layout provided in there of where all these tables are going to be. So again, if you walk into the to the big convention center and there's 95 tables there and it's like well where do i find the office of attorney general if you save them as a favorite on the app on that map it will actually highlight them and show where your favorites are located Um, and there's an faq uh, section in there there's tips in there for working the job fair and so forth so uh, i would highly recommend anybody that's going to come would also download the app also the app continues to be live after the event is over. So it's a great way after the fair to go back and again to have that information there about the companies. Well, I think the moral of the podcast today is if you go to CPEC and you are unsuccessful, it is of no one's fault but your own. We're giving you tips. We have we will be there physically to help you. Uh, Professor Miller, Kristen Fike, Steve Hassinger will all be there if you need help. Uh, you certainly can reach out to Career Services ahead of time to brush up that resume. And certainly you have the CPEC app that's going to be available with the map, with the FAQ section, and will be open after the fact. So, well, gentlemen, that brings us to another episode, uh, end of another episode of the Nightly News Podcast. And uh, frankly, I'm just really looking forward to CPEC and I certainly look forward to seeing you there Parker and of course Steve I look forward to working side by side with you but uh, it's always a fun event and please make sure you're coming out to the CPEC job fair on February 18th well Parker thank you very much for joining us today my friend it was great to be back on the podcast always and we look forward to having you back again later on in the term and Steve as always thank you for taking time out of your unbelievably unbelievably busy schedule to join us with the nightly news podcast thank you for having me and for your ongoing support of career services and CPEC always all right so for uh, nightly news secretary Parker Rose and career services director Steve Hassinger this is professor Paul Miller and we'll see you again next time on the nightly news podcast (laughs) 